Good evening, brethren. I hope you're all well. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. There's a good number of us. I think we're expecting uh, a few more to join, but um, we'll kick off on the dot. Um, so we've got plenty of time to get through everything that Dan's got to um, impart, all of his knowledge. Um, I'll put you all on mute just whilst we're uh, going through Dan's slides, but uh, at the end, Dan's happy to receive um, questions. So we'll have a little Q&A at the end. Um, at the very end, I'll uh, thank Dan for a fantastic presentation. And then I'll announce our next event, which will be on the 1st of September. I'm uh, extremely excited about that one. Um, so please do hang around and uh, hear what it is. Um, you're not here to hear me rabbit, about, rabbit on, so I will pass over to Dan. Thank you very much for doing this, Dan. Um, as I said, you may have seen that I, um, Dan and I went through this last night very quickly, um, and I was very impressed. So I'm looking forward to the, the, full, the full throttle of the, um, the presentation this evening. Dan, thank you. Can you, are you there, Dan? I can't hear you, Dan. We can view your screen. Sorry, just trying to take myself off of mute. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yep. Fantastic, sorry about that. Okay, so, um, Thank you everybody for joining. Just a quick heads up that you will need a pen and paper for one part of this. So if you haven't got that, maybe now's the time to quickly run and grab it. Just a single piece of paper and a pen. Um, nothing, nothing too worrying, believe me. Um, this, this talk will be reasonably interactive. I'm gonna try and make it as interactive as possible. However, a lot of it will be me just sort of going through the information and hopefully there will be some opportunities at the end to do a Q and A, so we'll go through that. But I will get started. So, thank you for joining this evening. The aim of this is to give you a flavor of what brand really is and how you can then apply some of those techniques to your club. The great news is that you don't need to be a graphic designer, a marketeer, a brand strategist, or anything like that to create a good brand for your club. Now, this topic is huge. Branding in general is just a huge topic and it's ever evolving. But the principles and basics rarely change. And it's those that I hope to explain tonight. And a lot of it's going to be common sense, but hopefully you guys will already be aware of parts of it, but it will just give you a little bit to take away and think about. And by talking about it all at once, it may highlight some of the things that you can do to go and evolve your brand. So the agenda this evening, we'll have about a, about a minute on me, uh, then we'll get straight into what is a brand. Um, Moving straight into then brand influence, brand loyalty, assessing your brand, your mission, creating a brand book, and then a Q&A. So about me, well, my name is Daniel O'Connell, and my current job is the creative lead or head of design for Camelot. For those of you that don't know Camelot, Camelot are responsible for running the National Lottery. So I get to work on one of the UK's biggest brands every day. I've previously worked at other advertising and marketing agencies on small, medium and large sized businesses. So I'm lucky to have been exposed to a wide range in the world of brand. So I'm a Hertfordshire Freemason and involved in a number of different orders. And I joined Freemasonry in 2011. And in 2012, I joined the Connaught Club in London. I was later a founder member of the Hertfordshire Light Blues Club, which is the Fleet House Light Blues. And that was around 2015. And I'm currently the secretary. So that is plenty about me. Let's get on. The current chairman of the Light Blues Club once said to me, clubs are like small businesses. And he's right. And I'm sure any of you that are on a committee will, will agree with that. And this is true in so many ways, but what it means is that all of the techniques that we can use on a small business for a brand perspective can also apply to your club. So what is brand? Well, this is going to be a whistle top store of brand and branding because I just haven't got the time to go through all of the detail. 
But what I want to do is discuss brand and what it is and, and, and how we can actually apply that. So what is easiest to do is to start with what a brand is not. So a brand is not a logo. Really, really common mistake. A logo is an identity. It's a great way of identifying yourself. But a brand is just so much more than that. It's not a color. Again, colors are great for navigation. Um, and you'll recognize some of these colors and instantly be able to name the brand below. But again, it's not the brand. A brand is not the product either. So you'll see products and you'll hear people say, I want that brand. However, that's not quite right. A brand is, um, a product is part of a brand, but it's not the brand itself. And lastly, a brand is not a promise, a headline or a tagline. And this is something that was banded around for quite a while, but it's not quite right. All of these things that we've just mentioned, you know, they all help to support a brand, but Marty, the author of The Brand Gap, which is a very famous book about branding, in a recent interview said, a brand is a customer's gut feeling about a product, service, or a company. Now, I think this is very, very close, but I would disagree slightly. I think the word customer should be removed and replaced. So I think it should read, a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or company. And it's that person that we've changed there because this all happens. A brand is living in everybody. It's not just in your customers. It's, it's anybody that you are touching. So I think it's really important that we narrow that down to a person. However, I think if we're looking, if we're looking at it from a perspective of the club, you know, we want to, we want to be involving everybody around our brand. So it's other Freemasons, it's the community, et cetera, et cetera, not just our members. Now, whichever one you believe, and believe me, Marty is a lot smarter than I am, um, the industry all agree that a brand is a reputation. It lives inside people and it's constantly evolving. And for a club, it's what your members, non-members, other Freemasons, and sometimes the general public will think about your club. Each person takes all of those raw ingredients that you throw at them. So advertising, marketing, any experiences that they have with you, and they form an opinion. It's what they hear, what they see, and what they touch. And it's the sum of all of these feelings which create an overall reputation for you. But it's not an exact science, and so it's very tough to get an exact measure. But if we all just think of a brand as a reputation, then you can't really go wrong. So now let's look at how a brand behaves. Brand influence is one of the most important behaviors. So always think of your brand as a friend of the consumer. Using this technique allows you to get into the mind of those consumers. You will want a friend who makes you feel good, who understands you, who interests you and excites you. And a brand is no different. So ask yourself, as a new and young Masons club, are you a good friend? Does your club display the personality of a good friend? You know, good friends will always check in um, with a communication when someone's been a bit quiet for a while, or they're always constantly there when you need them. So the two main points to understand here about brand influence are trust and engagement. I'll start with engagement. A brand can be engaging in lots of different ways, but a true sort of two-way relationship between um, the brand and the consumer is very, very hard to achieve, certainly in business. However, as clubs, it's a great place that we can start to foster this. It's a bit easier as a club because our members join to be engaged because they want to be part of what we're doing. And so if you engage with your members just the right amount, it will be easy for you to then become a friend and to stay friends. Now, moving on to trust. Trust, um, like any relationship, really, trust is the key quality required to maintain strength and a strength of a relationship. The consumer needs to feel confident that you as a brand is reliable, but also you have that consistent quality. 
we're looking at brand influence here and brands with high levels of trust are often more influential. That's where they can start to adapt what, they, what their consumers are doing a bit more. But how does brand influence actually work? Well, <clears throat> this is something that hopefully you guys will understand. I would argue that clubs are sub-brands of the UGLE. The UGLE is like the master brand, it's Freemasonry. Um, people who dislike Freemasonry are probably not gonna be that keen on our clubs, but people who like Freemasonry will generally support them. If there was like a huge scandal at the UGLE, it would have a knock-on effect down to our clubs. And likewise, if there was a huge scandal in one of our clubs, God forbid, that would have a knock-on effect probably to our province and then up to the UGLE, depending on how bad it was. So what's important to recognise here, and the reason I bring this up is that there are also outside influences which can always have an effect. Your brand, if your brand isn't very strong, it can be negatively affected by the master brand or other brands around it. So how do we use brand influence? Once you have it, once, you, you know, once you've engaged these people and, and, and you're influential towards them, you can behave like a friend and you can encourage your audience to engage with you more. For a club, this should mean that more people are accepting invites to things like events and more people are sort of having that desire to either join your committee or be involved in the types of things that you're doing. Basically, it's the first step in a two-way relationship, which is really important. Now, recently you would have noticed that brands are becoming more and more vocal about public, social and political issues. Some brands naturally lead themselves to certain ideologies. And for me, it's been fascinating to see brands using their voice to promote public and social issues like Black Lives Matter and gay pride. This is completely new. It's, it's, it's you know, something that's just started happening in the last probably five or six years. We haven't seen much of this before. Now, recently I was watching the television and an expert came on and said, it's preposterous that brands should hold political views and express them. Brands are not people. Now, I couldn't, I couldn't disagree with that statement anymore. We've just been speaking about brands being friends. And so if, you know, brands are not people, then how can they be friends? And actually the evidence shows that brands may not have much of a choice in, in the matter. In 2019, a survey found a whopping 74% of consumers think that brands should all take a stance on issues like climate change. And data released uh, last month showed that even if speaking out on issues like Black Lives Matter is politically diversive, studies show that more people agree it is worse to say nothing at all. Now, as a debate, this will completely rage on because, as I say, it's, it's new in the world. But it's worth thinking about from your brand's perspective and how you want to act. But once you're in control and once your brand is influential, you will then start to be able to use that influence. And that is what brands are currently doing, which is really interesting. So moving on, brand loyalty. Once we've got that influence high enough, we're great friends and you know, we've got this great two-way relationship, a brand can then turn into loyalty. This is when people act as spokespeople for your brand, promoting it out to others. You may hear the term brand, uh, brand advocacy, which is basically the same thing. The challenge for any brand is when it comes to loyalty, that they maintain consistency in their values, in their authenticity of the way that they communicate and they nurture that relationship with their committed consumers, with the real people that are giving back to the brand. So one thing to take away is just always consistency is key. And however, if you get it right, your brand will really rock it as you see here with <clears throat> the Apple example. As, more, as you have more brand loyalty, the more become advocates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as committee members of New and Young Masons clubs, you're already in this category, you're already advocates, you already go around doing this stuff. But I'm sure you can also think of some regular members of your club who fit the brand advocate or spokesperson. It's that guy who will always wear the badge and the tie with loads of pride and 
take every opportunity to tell all the other people that the club is the place to be. And if you can't think of that person, maybe now is the time and a great idea for this to be a point for improvement. So this is hopefully the heaviest section, but to finish it off, here is a typical consumer funnel. This may help you see how somebody becomes engaged with a brand and how they ultimately become an advocate. And this is what you really want to follow. So we start with, on the left-hand side, awareness. That's your marketing flyers, posters, social media, etc. At some point, they see you. They, they see what you're doing and they become aware of your presence. Once they're aware, they move on to a period of consideration. They decide if they do or do not want to join the club. Now, I find this quite interesting because all of our clubs are different. Some will have a, um, pay, a payment entry. So that, that holds even harder on that consideration because you've actually got to decide if you feel it's value. If it's a free club membership, then maybe this consideration period is, is, is less time. But everybody will take, even if it's 10 seconds, just that time to think about it. Now, once they've thought about it, if they're going to move forward, they become converted. They, they buy and they take the plunge. And for me, this is where you see most members will probably sit in a lot of your clubs. Um, people will join the club, but they don't engage. You might see them come through, uh, however they join as a form or as an email, et cetera, et cetera. And they kind of stop there. So if we move on to the influence and loyalty that we've just spoken about, this is the big one that we've got to get right. Once they convert, it's how do we drag them up? How do we bring them along and engage with them so that they become a friend of ours. Once they are a friend, it's not too difficult to then convert them into an advocate. And once they're properly engaged, they will go and shout from the rooftops about what you guys are doing. So just moving on now, I'm gonna talk about assessing your brand. So we're gonna bring this a little bit closer to home. It's really important to constantly assess your brand and keep it evolving. If you want brand loyalty and influence, there are some key things that you need to think about. So are you different? Do you stand out from the crowd? Now, interestingly, most of our clubs won't have a lot of competition because we're the only club within our province. However, it's not just about standing out from other clubs. When we started the Fleet House Light Blues Club, one of the things that we noticed was there were notice boards up in all of the centres locally. So we wanted to put a poster there. But when we looked at the notice boards, all of them were printed A4 on white pieces of paper. So one of the things that we did to stand out was to print A3, which is twice the size, and in full colour. So we did a blue and black and white type image. But it really, really stood out. And later on, when we did surveys, it was something that came up as a good point for people to have noticed us. Secondly, are you, um, are you relevant? Now things are changing constantly and I know Freemasonry does move reasonably slowly, but it doesn't always have a hold on everything. If we look at COVID at the moment, you know, are you relevant? Are you doing relevant things now for your clubs? And you have to make sure that you're constantly keeping up because if you don't keep up, you'll lose that loyalty, you'll lose that influence. And lastly, are you vigilant? You know, are you aware of your brand? And, you know, is it slipping away? Have you got goals? You know, are you agile enough to be able to react to things quick enough if they occur? And that is something that I'm just going to move on to talk about a little bit more. So, I'm just gonna go through a quick case study that I've always found quite interesting. Burberry, um, a company who really did not assess their brand well at the start. Now, traditionally, they're an overcoat manufacturer with a demographic firmly in the affluent and luxury area. They started in the mid 1800s and Burberry always had a sharp eye for marketing. Its founder, Thomas Burberry, ensured that the Victorian uh, luminaries wore Burberry waterproofs and et cetera, et cetera. He would always give away coats so that people could see them. Now, with the arrival of the First World War, Burberry also outfitted some British troops and christened the trench coat, which they've always been really famous for. Now, the quality was always admired 
and the brand was in great shape with the posh kind of outdoorsy demographic. Now, it had a sort of staid clientele, but it had a very loyal clientele. However, in 2001, they hired a gifted designer, Christopher Bailey, who had previously injected sex appeal into Gucci women's wear. One of his first statements was to make Kate Moss the face of Burberry. Now, Burberry was suddenly and really unexpectedly cool. They turned against all their values and that demographic. They didn't want to be cool. And they began to license their style to other manufacturers, producing things like high-end dog beds and home furnishings, etc. This went against what the brand originally stood for, which started, it started reasonably well. Everybody thought Kate Moss was a great person to bring on board and the sales started to go up. However, it soon spiraled completely out of control. The Burberry check pattern became an icon of fashion and celebrity, which it hadn't been before. The working class aspired to own its products, and it wasn't long before the markets of England were full of cheap imitation Burberry check, and I'm sure we all remember seeing it. This once traditional and exclusive brand had morphed, aspiring to football hooligans and wannabes, and completely repelled its original client base. The posh outdoorsy demographic didn't want to be associated with it. They didn't want to look like the market goers. And the brand became completely misunderstood because a lot of the people that aspired to own Burberry just couldn't afford it. So they needed to change. And I went back to the drawing board and did some brand analysis, which is what we're going to talk about in a moment. Now there was no point going back for the gentry. They were completely long gone. Burberry quickly realized that they needed to tell a new story and fix their brand values in a completely new way. They switched to be more lifestyle, limiting that famous check pattern and opening up to a younger kind of professionals market. In a time where digital marketing was in its infancy, they embraced it. They streamed catwalk shows, they heavily spent on digital and social media ads when that just wasn't common. Now, they still struggle to shape that image of the Chav, but they are slowly building that brand back to its former prestige. The case study is a real example of what happens when you're not vigilant and how you're not always in control of your brand. So having a strong set of values and staying consistent is always so important. If you've got that pool of people that believe in you for a reason and are following your brand for that reason, it's really important to stay with that. So moving on to your brands, the first thing you need to do is to assess. And do you, know, do you know your audience? Who are you targeting and what do they want? Now a brand, as I said before, should be a two way thing. You should be listening and also providing information. So a question to ask you is, do you do a survey for your membership? If you do a survey, do you reach out to non-members for their opinions? And then once you've got that data, does that shape your offering? Does that shape what you're actually about as a club? And also, does that shape the way you market it? Now, once you know your audience, how do you become attractive to them? If we go back to the example of being a good friend, I always like to ask, what is your personality? And a great exercise to do around a table or a Zoom call is to ask your team to create or to name a famous person that your club would be. So if your club was a famous person, who would it be? Could get you to start thinking about personality and all of those traits that you should be pushing out. Now, defining a brand personality can be long and a complicated process but the general purposes come from Carl Jung who says that there's a theory that there are 12 essential characteristics existing in anybody's unconscious mind and we use this and I've gone through this process many times with lots of businesses and it can take weeks and months but as a club I think just going back and just trying to think about what your personality is can really really help you. 
So we have things like the magician, the hero and the creator and so on. And these are then grouped into four main sections, which are ego, order, uh, social and freedom. So which one does your club fit into? Are you a social caregiver who provides a great place for your members to meet? Or are you an ego, uh, egotistical magician using technology to spark change in our Masonic society? Now, of course, you're going to be a mixture, but actually defining one of these helps your members and potential members understand you better. The clearer you are on what your personality is, the clearer it will be to them on whether or not they want to join you and be part of what you're doing. And again, once you've got that right, it leads to brand loyalty. So moving away from that and into tone of voice. Now, this is something that personally I've always found incredibly interesting. It's all about how you communicate with your audience. Do you communicate as an old traditional institution? Because that's what Freemasonry is. Or are you fun and friendly? Like all businesses, Freemasonry has its own internal language. You know, we constantly use anacronyms and specialist words that people on the outside would never understand. So as a brand, as a club, you have a decision to make. Do you aim for those people who understand it in the hope that those that don't will start to begin to understand it? Or do you convert to what is known as mum's language, basic English? When you're writing things like newsletters or communication, should you use the full titles and ranks when identifying somebody? Or is it best just to use their name? Some brands will adapt their tone of voice to the situation, so be light and fun on social media, but more professional and authoritative when they're advertised. The tone of voice should match your personality and again relate to the type of friend that you want to be. Now, identity. Identity over the years has diminished a little in its role within brand. There was a time when most people felt that the logo or the mark was the most important thing to get right. And it still plays a huge part. And it's the way that a customer basically navigates towards what you do. Identity consists of many features. It's your logo, it's the typography or the font that you use, it's the colors you use and your style, etc., etc. It's all basically those visual elements of a brand. And it does what it says it identifies you so keeping a constant and uh, look is so important as without consistency you may not appear to be who you are to the rest of the people and this then starts to lead to confusion for anybody looking at your marketing now in 2013 the UGLE approached August who are a design consultancy with the view to assess their identity. Program Master at the time said, as we head towards 2017, UGLE has been examining how it can enhance and modernize the face of Freemason. So with the tercentenary in mind and talking about the potential rebrand of the UGLE, he also said, it is also about the image we project. We need a visual identity that is recognizable that represents our values and heritage and also reflects our relevance to society. So the coat of arms has run its course and having worked with a number of old institutions um, myself, it becomes very apparent that a coat of arms just doesn't work well on screen. Once this becomes an avatar or something very, very small, you just cannot see that detail. So, in a digital age, we, uh, you know, there's a demand on us to be digital in our identity. And the initial research that August established was that the square and compass was the most recognisable symbol of Freemason. It ticks those boxes of heritage, values, and obviously works on a digital um, display as well. And if we look at the typography, the typeface that they've used underneath, they've gone with a serif which keeps that traditional look and it sort of feels and represents the society well, I think. As with all identity changes, the initial reaction in the craft was mixed. Some loved the fresh new approach, while others felt that the symbol looked like a closed lodge or even a bird's mouth. But 
the UGLE went on to create some guidelines as well to go along with this. And personally, you know, it's my opinion, I think this has settled well as an identity, although personally, I'd love to get hold of the brand in general. So for a bit of fun, if you grab your pens and paper, all I want you to do is put one line down and one line across, so you create four boxes. Now, before we start this, this has got absolutely nothing to do with any of your drawing skills. So this is not going to be judged on your drawing, it's nothing to do with drawing at all. This is everything to do with memory. Okay, are we ready? You have two minutes without checking to draw these four famous logos. So off you go. All I will ask is whilst you're doing it, is please put something in each box. Even if you can't remember it, put something that you think feels right. Just have your best guess, I suppose. Okay, about another minute. So once again, if you can't remember, just have a guess. Try and get something in each box. few more seconds doesn't have to be detailed just the outline really and what I'm going to ask you all to do is just hold that up to the screen if you wouldn't mind I might take a quick screenshot how do we get on ah some good ones very nice thank you thank you all okay So, the purpose of this is to show that simplicity is key. A simple logo or mark is very effective, but a, compl a complicated one does not live in the memory well at all. So, if you want your identity to be remembered, just keep it simple. And hopefully, some of you got, got these. Now, what I find interesting is, I don't know if anybody did, I didn't notice, but Starbucks changed their logo in 2011. And when I've done this previously, people draw the word Starbucks around that logo because it used to have that. And that just goes to show that that lives in the memory for like nine years. You know, we're so used to seeing things, but sometimes we don't change that. Once we've seen a, a mark or a logo, that just sort of stays with us and we, we continue thinking of it like that. And it just proves how powerful identity can be used correctly. Now you'll all notice that's only three of the four. So let's move on to Weatherspoons. Weatherspoons have over 800 pubs in the UK. And I wouldn't mind betting that everybody on here has been in at least one of them, if not quite a few. Now they, they're a well-known brand and this is their identity. <laughs> now on the left, this is what you'll see in some of their pubs. Um, used as signage, etc., etc. The middle one is also used in their pubs, but it's what's currently on their website. And the other one is the new app, which I did see some people have drawn, which is really interesting. So if you did struggle to think of Weatherspoons, even though you've probably been in them over and over again, and you know the brand really well, I'm, I'm not surprised. The changes have been vast and also inconsistent. The difference between these three are huge. But one thing I will say is that Weatherspoon's brand as a whole 
is pretty consistent. It's pretty strong. I think most of the public are quite clear on the values and the offering of the business. If you were to ask people what the Weatherspoons do and how do they do it, most people would have a similar kind of effect on what they feel the brand offers. So that's a question to ask. Does the identity matter at all? And it's something that's always worth thinking about. If you keep it simple, I think you'd always be in a really good place. So what I want to move on now to talk about is, again, your, your clubs and, and, and how you can potentially go away and start thinking about some other things which might help build your brands. So we've spoken about the personality traits of a brand and we've also spoken about how it looks, etc. Now this is the last section and it's the mission and the message. The mission of any brand is important. Internally, it gives everyone a focus and a north star to navigate towards. It keeps everybody moving in that same direction towards that same goal. The mission is also important to the consumer as they want to know where you're going. And in a club, that becomes really important as your members are really invested in what you guys are doing. Now, a strong mission reflecting the brand personality can bring everything together and create that all important consistency that I keep talking about. Now, it is said that Sir Christopher Wren was walking through St. Paul's Cathedral during construction and he saw a group of builders and stopped to ask, what are you doing? The first man replied, I'm cutting a piece of stone. Wren then went to walk on and saw another man and asked him the same question. And he said, I'm earning five shillings a day. A third man he saw was fully engrossed in his work and he addressed him the same question. And the man answered, I'm helping Christopher Wren build a beautiful cathedral to the Almighty. Now, that man had vision. He could see beyond the cutting of a stone, beyond the earning of his daily wages, to create a work of art, the building of a, of a huge cathedral. And what that does is a great mission statement does that same thing. It enables people to see beyond their own purposes and understand the bigger picture. In a similar story, JFK was walking around NASA in a tour and he stopped to shake a, uh, to shake a gentleman's hand who he didn't know was a janitor. And he asked him a simple question. What do you do here? The janitor replied, I'm helping put a man on the moon. Again, the clear vision of NASA had flowed through all of its employees, where even the janitor realised that his job of cleaning floors would stop dust getting into the engines and ultimately help put a man on the moon. So his role was as important as the top senior designers in putting a man on the moon. And again, a clear mission statement can help in give everybody in your team, everybody in your club, guidance towards the same goal. So with clear thinking in mind, it's really important to be single-minded. Both of those things were very singular-minded. When creating any messaging for your committee, your members, your potential members, anything you do with advertising, always try to be single-minded. And here's an example why. On the left is a typical MP3 player advert uh, from many moons ago. And this MP3 player has 16 gigabytes, it has Bluetooth 4.0, and it has 50 hours of, uh, of runtime. Now, going back to that tone of voice that we were speaking about earlier, we know not all consumers will understand this, certainly in the early 2000s. You know, did my mother know what a gigabyte was? No chance. If we want everybody to understand, we must use mum's language. And the reason the iPod did so well was that it used simple marketing. It said a thousand songs in your pocket. So simple, but it tells the consumers everything they need to know. It's completely single minded. And it's worked wonders for companies like Apple, as the simplicity brings trust and ultimately that brand loyalty. So we're going to play a very quick game about single-minded propositions. 
I'm going to flash a single-minded proposition on the screen and I would like you to shout out the company behind it. Now they're going to get harder so please do all have a guess but take yourself off of mute if you want to shout it out as I as I go through. Not all of these are externally facing. Some of them are, some of them aren't. So some of these are what the company use internally to help their employees and there's four of them. So let's start with this one. Nike. Nike. Pretty easy. Nike. Right? It's external facing and really well known. But boy, do they get that right. Everybody knows what Nike do and understands their philosophy. Okay. Good shout. Yes, Colgate. Brilliant. <laughs> Easiest way to wire to teeth. And actually, we know that we know we know that it's going to be in that area because it talks about white tea, but it could be some kind of dentist or something. Um, but yeah, another one that works very well. We're gonna take a little step up here. Google? No, close. Uh, I Microsoft like Office or 360 or something like that. No. Amazon? No. Are you all in the ballpark? Neighbours. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what it is. Ted. Ted Talks. So their whole philosophy is just about spreading ideas. Someone standing on a stage and spreading ideas. Simple, completely single-minded. And the last one, I don't expect anyone to get this, but I've used it because I really like it. Ten points if you do this. <laughs> no. Well, I'll, tell it, I'll tell you what it is. It's Ogilvy, the branding agency held by David Ogilvy, who you might have seen in some TV programs, etc. Recently, and actually, as an agency, as a as a branding agency, what they've always done when they do marketing and advertising is they tell their customers we sell or else. And it's so good. You know, imagine sitting around a table at that at that agency when you're trying to create an ad, and you just just ask your teammates, you know, is you know, we've got to sell or else. This is it's so important that we get this right. So hopefully you've all understood what we, you know, the brand in general. And um, again, happy to take some some um, some questions afterwards. But what I want to now do is talk about how you guys can create a brand book. So it's been a real quick run through of all of the elements of branding, but what I want to do is kind of have a bit of a recap and how you guys can move forward in doing that. So my suggestion to every club would be that you create a brand book. My club has had one for a few years and you can see that on the screen now. And we're just about to create version 3.0. So we had a first version, a second version, and we're just about to revisit it. We've decided it's time to survey our membership and adjust our brand for the future. And when we created the second version, we decided against the mission statement and we opted for three principles, which are explore, discover and engage. Now, this has served us really well up till now, but it's now time to assess and see if that is still applicable. And it's certainly not to say that it won't be applicable. It's just we need to assess it. We need to check that that's still what we want to be doing and what our members want. So creating a document like this allows everybody to be clear on the brand. And it works really well as a nice introduction to new committee members. So if you find yourself wanting to assess your brand, you think that's the right time to do it. Here is how you could do it. Get ready to basically go on a journey. It's going to be fun. It will be exhausting. But what you need to do is make sure everybody is, is ready to go through the process and has open minds at the start. And the first thing you should do is build a team. So involve some senior stakeholders. That might be top people in your province. It might be your chairman or your president, etc. Really important that they're involved. Also involve committee members. Just as important that those guys are involved. Involve people, members who are not committee members, because they will always have a different point of view. 
and then look to some non-members now how you do this is entirely up to you you can plumb for just freemasons that are in the province you can maybe go for people who haven't joined who are part of your demographic or you might just ask your wives etc um or you know it's it's worth looking at from a non-members perspective how you adjust and how you get that different point of view from what you're doing because that always can really help the next thing to do would be to create a brand audit so do a deep dive into what works and what can be improved it's also here that you want to start doing things like surveys those results will enable you guys to have an open discussion about your club but always remember to focus on those positives as much as you do the negatives don't throw the positives out just as we know we're doing that well let's leave that to the side we need to focus on these negatives because sometimes just bolstering those positives can really really help you next thing to do would be to define your demographic who you're targeting and how will you reach them most clubs have a very defined demographic um, but how do you get the message to them and how will you focus on a certain type of person within it so some of your clubs may wish to go after entered apprentices that may be what you feel is the right thing to do others might think that it's best to target people after their third degree or after they've come out of the chair etc there are lots of different theories on how you do it but you've got to work that best for your club and all of that will come out of discussions with your committee next would be to articulate your brand so create a mission or a goal and just create a set of values now that you've got the answers from the survey you know who your demographic are you can easily set a create and create a set of values or goals or a mission statement for those people <clears throat> now this doesn't have to be fancy it doesn't have to be technical and a few good sessions around a table or around a zoom will help you narrow that down really quickly now that you're armed with a mission and a goal you can decide how your brand should act to clarify your message what is the personality of your brand as we said earlier if it was a person who would it be that's a really good fun exercise what is your tone of voice how do you talk and create a single-minded proposition if you feel that that something will help your club it's important to document all of this as you're going along and to make sure that you decide what you need as a club what i'm telling you is just some advice you know i wouldn't follow this verbatim um, tailor it to your own needs now some of you will feel that a single-minded proposition will really work well in maybe attracting new members but some of you will feel that just a tagline will do the same thing so work it to however you feel comfortable the next thing to do is just divide and um, sorry define the visual elements so your logo your font that you use your colors your images etc how do you do that stuff some of you will want to go to a designer or have somebody in your club that can do that but going to that designer with all of the information up front will get to a much much better result so giving that person direction already knowing where you want to go will enable them to create an identity which really works well with your brand And lastly, create a brand book. Just write it all down. Once it's agreed, document it and put it together and then start passing that around to your team. Most brand books um, are internal documents. They're not really to give to your members, but it might be something you want to share with them. It might be something you want to tell them that you've done. And last but not least, roll out. Set a launch date if you want to set a launch date and have a big celebration or a party or however you want to do it for your new rebrand. Or you can slowly, slowly transform. You can start leaking these things out as they become important. It's important to make a decision on how, the, how you do that. Sometimes it's great to set that launch date because it gives you and everybody else a big boost of energy. But also sometimes you might have a a load of membership packs which has got the old logo on it which you spent a couple of hundred pounds on that you don't want to throw away so it might just be a blended approach for a while that you'll use up what you've got and then once you replace that you'll put the new 
logo, the new brand feel together on them. So I believe Mitch is recording this, and this is really just so that people can see the process without going through each slide. Um, but here's the overview. Right, my final thoughts. Um, branding can be very complicated. There is a reason that big brands pay hundreds of thousands of pounds to brand agencies. However, our clubs are not big brands. We don't require that level of detail. So by following some general principles, anybody can improve their brand. A few tweaks may see a lot more engagement within your membership. And that's what it's all about. So if you take away two things, I think keep it simple and just be a better friend. The two things to really think about. Now, I hope it's been informative and I hope it's not been too dry and I'm happy to take any questions, if anybody has any. Dan, I've got a question for you. Um, just looking at some of the, 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 the stuff that you've got in there, uh, really fantastic content, by the way, some really good stuff. I've been scribbling away a lot um, and taking quite a bit from you on there. Um, you've been to a, a good few of the conferences for the New and Young Masons and there are some fantastic ideas in other clubs across the country. What would you say would be uh, the one thing that you've seen in terms of brand that you haven't got in the Light Blues Club that you would really like to, uh, to poach? That's a really good question. Um, one thing that I've always felt about out the light blues club that I'm from is that we have really good engagement. We always have from the start. So we're a fee paying club. Our, it costs about 25 pounds to join and then 10 pounds a year, but we get about 20% engagement at our events. So if we, we've got about 120 odd members and we're normally <laughs> got 25 to 30 people at each event, which is I think a pretty good number for engagement. So I think we're doing that type of stuff. Well, Things that I've seen, ideas that I've seen, um, I love the Masonic Passport. I know that I think um, Bedfordshire were doing that and I know Essex have recently started doing that as well. I think that's a really good idea because again, it gets people about. And if you've got one of those brand advocates that I was talking about earlier, one of those spokespeople who loves the club, they'll go to different centres, they'll go to different lodges and they'll talk about the club. So for me, I think that's a really good thing that will help boost your brand as well as being a really neat idea if you're into going to different lodges. Lovely, thank you. Cheers, Lee. Uh, Dan, uh, I'm part of the, the Dare Club and I'm the chairman of it. And uh, one of our recent discussions was about having a, a lapel pin uh, for people to be aware of us and all the rest. How do you think that engages some people? And do you think that's something that clubs should do? Yeah, I think a tie or a, or, or a pin is so vital. Um, I think it makes a huge difference because you have a number of things. You get the FOMO factor, which is fear of missing out. So somebody will walk into a lodge and they'll see somebody with one of those pins or, or, or a tie or whatever. And they'll aspire to want to be part of that club because they want the pin, right? Um, I'm sure Mitch will, will, will be able to tell you the story of when the Connaught Club had uh, a very special pin once that was a slightly different colour and everybody really, really wanted to get <laughs> the special colour pin. But I think... I think what it does, yeah, it, it builds and it also builds a brand. It enables people within the lodge to see the numbers of your membership, but they instantly become visible. And also if you've got people again, that are advocates that are out talking and if they're representing themselves well, it's great. There is the, there's the other side. If they're not representing themselves well and they're wearing your bags, that drags your brand down slightly. But I think it's overall a really positive thing. And I would definitely suggest it for our club. Uh, it's always worked very, very well. Thank you. Sam, do you think, um, based on what, what you've said sort of generally and, and, and obviously with the new young Masons clubs in, in respect to Freemasonry being a little bit new, um, we should maybe work a bit more together to try and get a general brand over, the, over all the clubs. Obviously, we've, we've got however many clubs there are and we, at the moment, are generally working independently but your logo is completely different to our logo other than 
the fact there may be a common theme of the light blue colour. Do you think we should be trying to incorporate something that would, would in essence give anybody anywhere the idea that what we are? That's a really interesting concept, actually. Um, I think all of the clubs probably need to remain distinct because each club will have its own entry requirements and its own type of thing. So some are very social, some are probably less social and, and, and more interested in things like visiting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think this is where the NYMC completely comes into play. I think if all of the clubs are attached to the NYMC and the NYMC builds a really interesting, engaging brand, that is what people start to see. But it doesn't necessarily need to be facing to all of our members, but it does to our committee members because they need to know where they can go to meet other clubs and, and talk and get advice. So it's a really interesting concept, actually, of, of whether or not we need something to tie us all together. But I think that thing could be the NYMC. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. I've noticed uh, in terms of the way clubs have progressed, I know, I know that the Essex Sports Club has done very, very well in developing and growing and, and Expanding, what from what you've seen, what has been what have been the particular keys to their success? What would you pick out as the thing that other clubs should emulate? I think it go it go, does go back to a lot of the stuff I put in here. It's being a good friend, reaching out to members who have joined your club but have not engaged. And you may, need to repeat it, you may need to repeat that regularly. You'll see um, in a marketing agency, if they're doing a, a promotion, they'll send out a, an email, say they use something like MailChimp. That will give them the data, which comes back and says who's opened it and who hasn't. The people that haven't opened it, a couple of days later, will get another email. And then they'll keep trying to work that down because eventually they'll start to get some engagement with those people. And I think you've got to do that with members. We try to do that with um, WhatsApp. Most of our members of our club are on WhatsApp and we have a WhatsApp group, but our committee members will occasionally just send private messages to people that haven't been engaging for a while just to see how they are, see how they're doing. And again, it's that being a good friend because once they feel that the club's interested in them, they start becoming interested in the club. So that, and the other thing I would say is just be consistent one of the things that's helped our club is that we've got a newsletter and this is certainly not to say that our club is is any better than any of the others but i'm just saying the things that have helped us we've got a newsletter called the deacon which goes out every other week and it does go out every other week on a monday morning it goes out that's it so that consistency allows people to feel a trust in what we do that when we say that we're going to deliver something that we constantly deliver it and the same with our events you know, we, we we try to be as consistent as possible with putting on events regularly like once a month etc so i think once you start doing that and i know it's unfortunately building a good brand is never a tick box exercise it's not something that's finite that's you know two plus two equals four and you're away you have to keep trying different things but i think the key is consistency and also just yeah, being a good friend, reaching out to people and doing a little bit of handholding sometimes. The way that you onboard a new member again is really important as well. So yeah, I think they're the things I would look at. I think, I think you brought out two really good points there, Dan, that I take away from that, which is being consistent and regularity, you know, because you know, we as the Dare Club try and hold events each time. And, and we try and run them for friends and family. So it's not generic Masonic stuff because we can always go and visit other people. So we try to do fun things. So this weekend was a cider barbecue. Next, nice. month, next month, we've got a speedboat weekend down at the beach. So we're just trying to engage everybody into that whole thing rather than just the Masons. I think that's great. And also that then leads, you know, does your brand then, when it talks to people, does it talk in that mum's language? Are you stripping away Masonic talk? Because what you're saying is that's what you need. You know, if you're if you're family orientated and you're fun, that's exactly how you need to represent yourself. In your newsletters, in all of your communications, that's exactly how you need to be projecting. You know, we're fun, we're family orientated, we don't talk in anacronyms, we don't do that type of stuff. We're, you know, we're on the level with everybody and that enables everybody to feel like they're welcome. 
Yeah, and, and that's what I've taken from this, and it's, and it's great because most of my committee are on here as well. So we're really? hopefully going to get all this same idea, and then we'll chat, post this at some point. Love. Dan, I'm not sure if you can see one that's come up from Ryan on there about the simplest, effective ways. Can you read it to me, Lee? I, I can't because I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, it's got um, from Ryan. What are the most simplest yet effective ways to promote a brand? I think, I think, just get, and I'm banging the same drum, but get that consistency right. That is so key. Once you're consistent, you can start building and doing complicated things. But there's so many brands that aren't consistent um, in every way. So just try and make your look consistent. You know, even if you're using things like templates, just try and make it always look like it's it's the same. You know, it's the same person talking all the time. Um, for me, that I think that's the simplest way of getting of getting across and building a brand. And again, just I think being a good friend will work wonders for anybody in a club um, making sure that you've got two-way communication all the time it's very easy as a committee um, to sit make decisions pump it out to the membership and sort of forget about it you need that that feedback constantly coming in of you know what's happening how are they interpreting it and then question if you've only if you have if you put an event forward and you only have five or ten people turn up and you're not happy with that Go back to the drawing board. Why did that happen? You know, just constantly evolve, just constantly ticking along because your brand is in everyone else's hearts and minds. So it never stays the same. So you can never stay the same. You've got to keep adjusting and twisting. And as I say, that's why big brands pay lots and lots of money to constantly be checking in and working out where their, you know, where their brand is going. Thank you. Dan, just a quick one. Um, is it worth you describing how social media fits in with building that brand and how important that is to the club? Yeah, really good point. Um, social media, I think you can look at it two ways. You can look at it as your voice. You can look at it from the perspective of this is our club and it's just an extension of how we talk and how we talk to people. Or you can look at it completely as a marketing platform. So, or I suppose a mixture of both. I think when you're using social media, and this is, I'll be honest, something our club hasn't got right. Again, it's that consistency. Can you schedule one post a week? It would take minutes. But if you schedule that post to go out at the same time every week, you start to build that consistency so people know. And there should be something happening in your clubs once a week that's reasonably interesting to the people that are looking. The other thing is get that two-way conversation going ask questions on social media don't always make statements so actually ask people <clears throat> and your membership or other people what do they think of x you know what should our next event be if we were going to do this type of event how should we do it etc ask some questions because believe it or not a lot of brands will use that theory and uh, they'll ask questions not because they want the answers necessarily but they want the engagement once someone started engaging with their brand, all of a sudden they start becoming, you know, they, they start becoming part of it and then they slowly become an advocate because they, you know, they, they feel part of that brand if there's been a conversation backwards and forwards. So I think, yeah, social media is really important. I'd say pick your platforms well. So you may choose to only use Facebook or Twitter or any of, you know, <clears throat> Instagram, et cetera, or you may wish to use all of them. But if you do use all of them, try not to allow them to go dormant. There is nothing worse than a website or a social media channel that has got nothing on it or hasn't had anything on it for a few months because your potential member will go away, look at that and think this is not an active club and this isn't a club that cares. So sometimes it's better just to have one channel and do it well than have three channels or four channels or five channels and do it badly. Thanks, Andrew. Dan, we just had a comment in the uh, chat feature um, from Dave Gleason of the Dare Club. It's worth, is it worth mentioning the Canva.com, which is a great tool for creating marketing materials and can be used for free? Do you use that or are you aware of it? So this, this, is, this is something that I'm certainly aware of. It. This is something that I fall down on and I believe that we may have a, a, um, 
a workshop coming up on how to do that type of thing, um, Mitch. So I didn't want to tread on anybody's toes. But yes, Canva is a tool that can be used as a graphic design tool that can be used to create banners and other things like that. It's very simple. I believe there's a, a, free, a free version and a, a paid version. I spoke to Jack, who I think uses it, um, and I said it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good tool. I haven't used it myself. I've been in agencies where it's been used a little bit, but unfortunately, because I'm, I've come up through the graphic design um, route at work, I'm pretty proficient in Photoshop, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so I always find that quite easy, and I just go to what I know. Uh, however, yes, something like Canva is great. There are other things as well. There's a free uh, piece of software called GIMP, which is very similar to Photoshop that you can use. And I think. Again, just with anything graphical, if you're not a competent designer, just keep it simple. You know, keep it as simple as possible. Nobody will expect your clubs to, you know, to look like you spent 10 grand on a, on a really nice rebrand. They're not going to expect that from you. What they expect from you is honesty and openness. So just do that. Uh, hi, Dan. Thank you for this evening. Um, we, we're starting, uh, or oh, I'm just working on a newsletter um and we've, we've decided to go with um is it the monkey um oh mailchimp uh, mailchimp thank you <laughs> no no escape me um <laughs> because it's been guys having to open pdfs and it auto formats we decided that we would go for quarterly but based on your discussion of being there as a friend and engaging would you say quarterly because you said you do yours fortnightly would you say quarterly is too little i mean that's that's clearly going to be a decision for your club i don't i don't know your club well enough and how active you are i find that when we do ours every uh fortnightly i can probably get around three or four articles in it so okay. that'll be one or two events that are coming up so we use it to promote our events. So if it's quarterly, that's probably not enough because yeah. you know, we won't get the message out quick enough. Um, and then there's normally other things that have happened. So it'll be reviews of events. We'll pull from what's happening in our province or in Freemasonry in general. Um, and then other times you can just post things in there which become really, it, it feels like a cheat, but it's not. You know, Look at other things that are happening on social media as somebody produced a really good video on YouTube that you've liked or someone on your committee has liked and, and push that out to your membership and say this is something that we've enjoyed you may enjoy it because again that's that it, you're building that friendship again you're saying you know a bit like you would send your friend a, a, a link that interests you okay once you get that going i think you know you'll probably find that fortnightly um maybe maybe too much but at least monthly will probably work well for you guys all right that's great thank you and, and just for any others i find I'm trying to get the, like you said, the social media more often. I find Hootsuite quite good for um, planning in and scheduling posts. It takes the hassle out of remembering to do it. Yeah, that's a brilliant Chris, just, Chris, just be careful with MailChimp. I found with MailChimp, a lot of times it, it can go into people's spam. Um, we've got one of our like blues clubs that uses it, and a lot of the times it does unfortunately go into spam. So unless your members know that you're using it, so it might just be worth you letting them know that you're using it to try and make sure the emails get to them. Okay, no, that's great. Thanks for the advice. Cheers, Dan. Thanks, mate. And, and Dan. I'm, Cheers, yeah, mate. I'll give you a bit of a tip on that. MailChimp doesn't particularly like, or um, the system doesn't particularly like, when you feed in email addresses manually or if you put them in via a, a spreadsheet. If you set up one of its um, sort of web-based uh, forms where your members can go along and add themselves, that really, really helps. So ours is all done automatically. When someone signs up on our website, our database is held on our website and MailChimp feeds from that. And it doesn't mind that either. But right. if you set up the form, it almost gives them a green light straight away because they've done it. Um, so yeah. I really wish you told me that before I plugged in the 340 email. <laughs> 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 Put it, <laughs> try and find another way of communicating with them and tell them to check their spam boxes <laughs> oh thanks dad i feel sick now cheers <laughs> <laughs> any more questions for dan uh, cheers dan really good tonight thank you no okay very thanks, good uh, thank you very much for
all the effort is you've obviously put into the presentation and the time you've spent on it, um, very much appreciated. I learned a lot. Um, I'm sure everybody else did. Uh, if not a lot, they certainly got one or two little points to take away and um, hopefully implement with their clubs. Um, the next event, let me just share my screen. The next event will be, and it pops up, here we are. The Craft, the world-renowned author John Dickey, uh, the author of The Craft, which was um, released pretty recently, uh, will be speaking to us to discuss his book on the 1st of September at 8.30. Um, I'm really excited about it. I saw um, quite a number of people um, from NYMC's um, posting about this book on social media. So um, I hope to see a lot of you there. Um, as I said, I'm really excited about it and uh, I hope to see you there. The sign up form um, on the NYMC website will be going live shortly. So um, I'll, I'll send around social media as well as emails to remind everybody about this. But um, yeah, I hope to see you there. Um, that's it from us this evening. I hope you have all enjoyed this evening. Um, keep safe, keep well, and um, I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Dan.